we're not going to be underachievers this year. We're going to be overachievers, right? Right. Yeah. We had the highest percentage of any of my classes, almost a B, and we got one A in this particular field, which isn't the case for all the other classes. So I know you guys are capable of more. Um, I'm going to be expecting different things to be the second half of the year. Now, I did this at the end of uh, last semester, and I'm just going to quickly do it for you here again, kind of tell you how this is going to be similar and different. You're still going to have homework. You're still going to have labs. That's not going to change. But the difference is the first half of this school year, uh, all of this was well, basically learn the fact and then spin it back. Okay? Um, write it on the test. There wasn't a lot of concepts that you had to learn. A few, like density, is kind of a concept, but it's also a fact. When we get to the second half now, I'm hoping that you're more mature, your brain's more mature, and you can start handling some more difficult concepts. So I saved those for the second half of the year. And it's largely chemistry and physics is what we're doing. In fact, the electricity and magnetism falls under physics. And it is such a hugely important part of the universe that it would be silly not to include this in your education. It's one of, electricity and magnetism are one of four forces that make everything in the universe work. The universe itself couldn't have formed without these. Life can't exist. The planets can't exist without these four forces. Electricity and magnetism is one. Another one is gravity. What's the center of gravity? Okay. That's the second of the four main forces. And then we have what's called the strong force and the weak force. We're looking at how atoms are held together, okay? Some very basic forces in the universe. So this is gonna be incredibly important to understand, to understand so many things in science later on. Then we get to uh, our physics unit. We're gonna learn a concept, put it into practice, just like we are this course. Learn a concept and build the circuits, okay? So it's concept and practice. And we did that last time, but this is gonna be much more about learning concepts. And I bring this up to you guys so that you understand why it's so important when you're absent to make sure you get all the information that you missed when you were gone. I remember in high school I was absent for a week or two with some big illness and I missed uh, a big chunk of chemistry when they were building the concepts. And when I came back, I was completely lost. There was no way I was going to catch up and just do a few worksheets. You can't teach yourself that. You, know? you have to learn it a little bit at a time. I couldn't give a kindergartner a book on algebra and expect them to be able to learn that. They have to learn to add and subtract. They have to learn their times tables, how to divide and multiply. And then you can get into algebra. The same thing is true for electricity, guys. It's a concept that is really difficult to understand if someone hasn't walked you through it from the very beginning. So I'm going to take you from a belief that you know nothing. And that's kind of been the case today. When I ask students what they know about this, it seems that they know nothing. And I'm going to take, I'm going to take little baby steps. We're going to learn our first little bit about electricity, and we're going to build on that, and build on that. And if you're gone, one of the days that we built a step, it's going to be really hard. You're going to come back, and it's just not going to make sense, okay? So just a reminder on what the routine is when you are gone. When you are gone, not are gone, the element, but when you are gone, when you are gone, you do what back there? Everyone's been able to tell me we go back there, but they don't know what they do. You just stand back there? You, you read what? You read what, though? What you missed. What are you reading? Silence. The little whiteboard, guys. Okay? Just so we're clear, because some people think you read the paper that's there. No. You look at the little whiteboard, the calendar. And if it's in black, what do you do? You get slack. You have to fill in the little sheet. You write down what the assignment was. Maybe it was a lab you missed that you can't make up. You fill it in. If you don't do that, you're not going to be excused from that, from missing that assignment. Okay? If it's written in blue, what do you do? You must, must do it. Where's the assignment going to be? It should be right back there, sitting right underneath the calendar. Okay? If it's not, you need to come ask me about it. Blue, you do. But you can't expect that you're going to be absent and it's not going to affect you. 
You see, this is another thing that I, I really feel responsible to teach you guys. It's not just about learning science this year. I'm supposed to prepare you for the demands of high school. And some of you mistakenly think, oh, I just missed one assignment. It's just a few points. It won't affect my grade. Well, maybe that one assignment won't affect your grade too much. Usually it does, but maybe it won't, okay? But what if it was building the concept and you missed a piece? You don't know how to do your fives. You know how to do your fours and sixes, but you don't know how to do your fives. Five times five, five times. Well, that's kind of a hole that's hard to work around. You see what I'm saying? And you can't build the next concept. So when you miss an assignment, you know, it's one thing to get a zero on. It's another thing to not have learned anything from it. I need to make sure you get the concept. So if you're absent, make sure that you're going back and you're watching the podcast, you're completing it, even if you don't turn it in. That way you know the concept that we built, okay? Um, my goal, when we're all done with this, is that you'll be able to answer these three questions, plus a few more, but these are the three main ones. We're going to talk about these here in a little bit. What is electricity, what is magnetism, and how are they related? Okay? Once we've learned each of these concepts, you're going to do a little lab. We're going to be building batteries, we're going to be building motors and electromagnets, and doing all these little labs after we learn a concept. Okay? And then we'll have three quizzes in here, and we'll have one test during this part. Okay? Then we'll get into more of a, well, let's apply this. Let's do something like we do in the real world. Let's build a circuit. This is where we build the metal detectors that you pay for at the beginning of the year. We're going to build those, and we're going to have a test on what we learn from building those. So there's two tests and three quizzes. Okay? We're going to have that test, and, um, and you're also going to take your metal detector and use it. That's part of the, uh, the final scoring on that. So no other big projects, you're not going to do a big writing project like some of you did and didn't do too well on in the forensics you, okay? And then as I said, fourth quarter we're into physics, we're going to learn a concept, then we're going to put it into practice when we build our Rube Goldberg machines. We're going to do a little bit with robotics, which isn't up here, and then chemistry. We're going to learn about the periodic table and some basics of chemistry before you go on to high school. And these are some difficult concepts. The other thing I need to ask of you guys because we've got some real good students in here, but it's important that at this stage in the game that if you get confused, if you don't understand something, you raise your hand and you're not too proud to say, Mr. Myers, I had no idea what you just said in the last 10 minutes. Your lips were moving, but I got nothing. Okay? I won't be offended. That's my job. If I didn't get it across you right the first time, I probably have three or four other ways to explain it. Once I run out of ways, well, then I'm out of luck. Okay? But I will try to explain to you a different way until you get it. But if you guys just sit there, smile, and shake your head at me, I'm going to think, oh, everything's wonderful. I'm such a good teacher. And then I realize that I'm not when I see how you do on the tests. Okay? So please ask questions if you get confused. Don't be proud because chances are someone else has the same question and they just don't have the guts to raise their hand and look like they don't know. Okay? Any questions on that? All right. Let's talk a little bit now because I want to find out what you think you already know about these things. Tell me, is electricity something that you can see? Yes? yes? Could be. Could be seen. Give me an example of how you can see electricity. Lightning. So lightning is electricity? Yes. So when you're seeing lightning, you're seeing electricity? You're seeing a type of Brianna says no. Explain. Well, like, it's not really electricity. It's electricity that makes the light. Ah, so the electricity makes light. Like this is electricity in this room is making these lights shine light. So the light I see is something different from electricity? Yeah. yeah. Right. Is electricity something you can smell? No. Is it something you can taste? No. Is it something you can hear? Hear. No. no. And you know, that, that might puzzle you a little bit because you're like, wait a minute, I can smell electricity. When the stove is on, I'm smelling electricity. Are you smelling the electricity? No, you're smelling whatever's on the stove. When too much electricity goes through a wire, it starts to melt the plastic around the wire. You're smelling the melted wire. When electricity cooks the chicken, you're smelling the chicken. You're not smelling the electricity. And you're not tasting it either. When you touch a battery to your tongue, that sensation you get is not the taste of electricity. 
I hope that's not dumb in your mouth. Hi. No, Anthony. Oh. Get rid of it. So here we have something you can't see, taste, smell, hear, but it's a very important part of the universe. Without it, the universe wouldn't go around. I can't even hold electricity in my hand like this, but it's something real, very real. So that's why this is kind of hard, because you can't exactly see it. Now, there are some forms of electricity that occur naturally. You gave one example, lightning. Okay? Anyone have a theory on how lightning forms? What do you think? Like the positive and the negative like electrons and protons and stuff. They try to like get together so they get neutral. And then when they hit, it makes that big hole. Where'd you learn that? Science and sixth grade. <laughs> Any other ideas? But it actually causes lightning? What other forms of electricity occur naturally? Give me an example. So what causes that then? What actually, I'm sorry? Friction. Friction. So will this make electricity? Why won't this do it, but my socks on the carpet will? What's the difference, you know? Ooh, can't store it. Wow. I'm getting some good answers, okay? Um, who invented electricity? Nobody. Who said nobody? Very good. A lot of people say one of these dudes. Which one do you think they say? No, that's the one with the tongue out. Thomas Edison, which one is he? He's the one that's No. Like this, like that. The brownish picture. Which one? That one, next to the lady in the... Second from the right. Yeah. Yeah, that's Edison. A lot of people think Edison invented electricity. No one invented electricity. We discovered it. Well, and that's not true either. Do you know who discovered electricity? Early man. <laughs> <laughs> well, probably you're right. The first person looked up in the sky and said, there's lightning. Now, maybe they didn't call it electricity, but they saw it. Yeah. Okay, well, I discovered it. I'm the first one that saw lightning. But the first person that described how it worked and that it was the same thing as we observe here in some other ways on Earth was Ben Franklin, who's one of the most famous people for doing that. Okay? But the point is, no one invented electricity. It's been here forever. And we need to have an understanding of how do we create it. Because who knows? Your life may depend on this at some point. Imagine. You guys watch Lost? Well, it's an addicting show, yeah. It's an, every, every episode they give you more information and don't solve any of the old stuff. It just gets more and more frustrating. But anyway, imagine you're on a plane and that plane crashes and you're the only survivor. And it's crashed on a deserted island. There's almost nothing there. You're playing, the radio's still fine, no batteries, no electricity. If you could just come up with a way of giving that radio electricity, you might be able to call for help and get rescued. See how useful science can be? When we're done with this, hopefully you'll come up with two, three, maybe more ways of how you could power that radio on that deserted island. Can I have your picture of this? Put your feet Thank you. So, how do we make electricity? Well, you talked about how maybe it occurs in lightning. How does it occur in the wall? How do we get electricity there? Where does it come from? Does that come from lightning? Turbines and generators and mobile electric? In factories, can you explain a little bit more? No, I don't know anything about it. It's like electromagnets and stuff. Okay, electromagnets that spin. Well, it sounds like you know something. It sounded pretty good, Jeff. Isn't it cold that when you burn it, it creates steam and like turns the turbine, which wow. like, generates it? You guys are so far ahead of the other classes, they had no clue. They just, well, it comes from the power company. How do they make it? Oh, okay. Well, it's got to be produced. We've got to get electricity to flow somehow. And you might even have a device, if you have an RV, it has a little generator in it, okay? That can make electricity. Maybe you have some clue how that works. I'm going to ask you to tell me your ideas. So that's why I'm trying to spark some, some thought right now. Because you're going to be, uh, no pun intended, yeah, that was good. Argon. Anyway. <laughs> See, it was funny. I did. So you're going to be writing your thoughts about both of those kinds of electricity. Static electricity. Rubbing your feet on the carpet. 
Static electricity in the clouds. How does that form? Where do you think that comes from? You're going to give me your thoughts on that here in a little bit. Electricity comes out of the wall outlet. How is that produced? Nathan has a good idea back there. It sounds like he has some understanding. Maybe you're missing some pieces, but we're going to fill all that in. And eventually, you should be able to make your own electricity if you need it. Okay? I'm going to show you several ways of doing that. Next, what do we have here? I'll give these to you. What do you have? That's a good answer. When you first hold it, you got metal. That's pretty clear. You can tell that from experimenting, holding it in your hand. But then you did something else, which was brought it together. And what did you observe? What's the most obvious thing that occurred? Magnetism. When you brought them together, they stuck, right? How many of you have played with magnets before? Okay, because one of the classes, only two people raised their hand. I think they were just chickens. Good. So you've all played with magnets. You remember back in the old days when you were young and innocent? Do you remember those days? Um, yeah. Don't you wish you could go back? You know, you believed in the tooth fairy. And all that kind of stuff. Oh, did I just ruin it for someone? <laughs> well, think back to those days. The good old days when you believed in that kind of stuff and you were fascinated and you could actually sit around. You didn't need a video game to entertain you. You could sit around with a couple magnets and you go, ooh, look at that. Magic force is moving it around, you know? <laughs> that was interesting to you. Well, at some point, you played with it for a while, you realized that, oh, they stick together, and you just accepted it. It's like, oh, they stick together. That's incredible, man. Think about that. There's no glue. I don't have to recharge these. They won't die out. I stick them together, and they stick. And there's a lot more powerful magnets than that. I, there's an invisible force in between there. What causes that? What is magnetism? Any ideas? So the light comes and starts trying to pull themselves together. Okay. What do you think? That's what I was going to say. Same kind of, has something to do with electrons? With electrons yeah. Okay. Well, you know, some people just accept it. It's just a magical, mystical force. The magnet fairies live in the magnets and they pull towards each other and bring them close. We need to unlock that because electricity and magnetism are the key to so many things in the universe. But you do know some facts about magnets. I know you do. I know you know that when we bring them together, they stick. But if I do this, what will happen? It will push away. It will repel. And you can feel that invisible force in there. We're going to unlock the answer as to why that happens. We know that a battery, you've all installed batteries, has a pointy end and a flat end. The pointy end is labeled positive. The flat end is labeled negative. A magnet, on the other hand, has two opposite ends. They are labeled north and south. So here I have electricity. Here I have a magnet. I have opposite ends. I have opposite ends. Hmm. It's not just a coincidence that these have opposites and these have opposites. So that leads us to our final question. How are electricity and magnetism related? Now, I've heard some really good answers. Anyone want to take a stab at that one? How are they related? Magnetism can generate electricity? Yeah. So if I gave, gave this to you right now, would you get shocked from it or something? No, but in a way, they can make electricity. So this has the ability to make electricity, but it's not doing it right now, is what you're saying? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, that's what I want you to think about, those things, so that when we get the answers, it has some meaning to you. I'm going to give you a worksheet to fill out now, and this is a thinking <coughs> exercise, which means there isn't a right or wrong answer. The first part, you're going to write about a paragraph, you know, four or five sentences, and I expect you to use up all this space because you're brainstorming. You're trying to think of what is electricity, how does it occur in the clouds and on your socks, that's natural electricity, and how do we get it out of the outlet? Okay, you had some ideas about that. Maybe you don't. Maybe you just would be guessing. That's okay as long as you can back it up. If you say, I think electricity is produced by generators, and the generators are turned because aliens crank them. They come down from space and they, they turn the generators for us. And you better have some proof that the aliens have been here on Earth. Okay? And you're going to give me your support for your belief. If you think it's because of magnets spinning and going by wires, you're going to tell me you know, your theory and why you say that. Got it? So how is electricity produced? And how do we get the natural versus the artificial? How are those made? What's your reason for saying that? 
Then in this next section, you're going to list what you think are the top 10 electrical devices of all time. It's a device that uses electricity. Go back to the beginning. Don't just think of modern, very, very modern things. Think of the first electrical devices as well. Think about the things that change our lives more than anything else. The most important one will be number one. Got it? And then don't worry about the last part. We'll do that in two. No other device that I can think of made more of an impact on society and the way we lived our life than the electric light. It extended the day. Uh, no longer did we have to you know, stop working when the sun went down. We can go and sow crops. We can um, continue to work in factories and have 24-hour shifts. The Industrial Revolution was greatly affected by electric light. Sure, there were lights before that. There was line light, arc light, handles. But none of them allowed us to have cheap light available to everyone to keep things going. Yes? What about fire? Well, yeah. There's, there's always ways of making light that doesn't involve electricity. My point was, is those are not practical. Can you imagine running a factory from everyone working from candles? You're not going to get very good quality merchandise that way. You're going to burn through a lot of candles. Now it became practical to actually, I mean, you can see them out there cutting down crops, sometimes at night with big old lights on there. It became practical to do that and to keep factories running. So it's not like there was no way of making light before this, but it definitely improved the way we did things. What do you think belongs to number two? Battery. Battery. You know, I'm not going to put it on two on my list, but it certainly belongs way up there. The thing about the battery, batteries have come a long way. You guys have no idea. In my lifetime, I've seen huge improvements. You know, the battery, uh, well, take for instance the cell phone, okay? Uh, your typical cell phone has four or more hours of talk time, right? Uh, the first cell phone, I know because I sold it when I was working at Radio Shack, uh, the mobile one was about this big, okay? Had big old batteries that were a hundred times bigger than the one on that. It's like half of a car battery strapped to this cell phone. And it had a cord attached to it and you carry this whole unit with you. And it probably weighed, I don't know, eight pounds. Imagine lugging that around. That was a big, bulky thing. And that was the best battery technology we had at the time. Now we make our devices use a lot less electricity, and the batteries can produce a lot more electricity. And so you have these tiny little cell phones. You've got drills and all sorts of electronic devices, iPods that run off of these incredible batteries, made possible by great chemistry. Okay? You're going to make a battery in here. So yeah, I would put batteries up high on my list. But what would you put in here? Very basic, use all the time. I'm going to put that at five because communication is important, but it's not on a daily basis necessarily going to be a, a, a survival kind of thing. So, you know, the telegraph came first, and then the um, telephone came after that, and that all made a lot of other things possible, like radio and TV. How many of you had those on your list? Okay. Yeah. You know, before radio and TV, news took a long time to travel from one point to another. And by the time it reached that point, it might have, something might have gotten lost in the communication. You know, when you're trying to fight a war and you can't tell your, your troops what they're supposed to do, it may take three days to get the information to them. That's going to make a difference in people's lives. Yes? What, what about the clock? You know, I wouldn't put the clock in my top ten, and here's the reason why. Because we had a perfectly good wind-up clock, and the Swiss had perfected that pretty well, and was pretty reliable. It did require you to do this periodically. Um, so, yeah, our modern electric-based clocks, they, they're more reliable, but it didn't give me a huge advantage. Yes? Bridge? Yes. I would put the refrigerator high on my list. And here's the reason why. You know, Again, you guys grew up with this. You don't even think about it. And yes, I grew up with a refrigerator, too. Uh, but my dad grew up with something a little different. He can call it a refrigerator. Call it a icebox. Ice We've heard about that. And you got to go back in time before we had refrigerators, or even an icebox. You want to eat, you got to have food. You go out and hunt, you shoot the deer. You bring the deer back. It's more meat than you can eat one day, or your family can eat. So you share it with others, or you add what to it? Salt to make it last. Otherwise, it's going to go rotten. 
it's going to be make you sick and you're going to throw it out. So that was the only way to preserve it. Then someone got the idea, let's put it in an insulated box and let's put some ice in there. And that led to the ice box. And even when my dad was growing up, the ice man would come and deliver a big block of ice. And you'd slide that in your ice box and that's what kept it cold before everyone had the electric version. Okay? So a big difference in the way you live your life because now instead of having to go out hunting every day for your food to stay alive or every few days because it would go bad, now you can go to Costco, buy you know, 10,000 rolls of toilet paper and all the other stuff that goes in the refrigerator and it will last for a long time when you have an electric refrigerator. What do you think is on my number two spot? Yes, good one. A lot of people don't think about that. You know, we have such good um, temperature here right now. And yeah, we can even get away without a heater right now. But air conditioner and heater, you know, makes places habitable. You can live in places that you otherwise wouldn't be able to. Um, for instance, you know, if you're going to live in North Dakota right now, you definitely want a heater. You know, Montana, places that are just bitter, bitter cold. Uh, out here, Tucson and Phoenix, we can credit a lot of our population explosion to the air conditioner. I mean, who wants to come and stay out here when it's 110, 115 degrees? Back in those days, this is what people did in Tucson to stay cool. Everyone would gather around, they'd have picnics by the river. Yeah, we had rivers. We now call them washes. washes. But they ran all the time. Many of our, our washes had water in them all the time. Or uh, if it got really hot in the summer, they moved their bed out onto the porch. And then if the bugs started bugging them, they'd screen in their porch. And we now call that a Arizona room. Call that Arizona room around the country, a lot of people do. So that was another way to stay cool. Uh, another strategy that led to an invention later on was to take, open your windows and take your bed sheets and get them really wet. Put them over the screens on the windows. And the breeze blowing through there would make your house cooler. It would work like a what cooler? Swamp cooler. Swamp cooler, an evaporative cooler. So those are all ways that we stayed cool in the early days before AC. But it was miserable. A lot of people didn't want to live out here because it was so hot. Uh, if you were a kid back then, the only place that had air conditioning was the movie theater downtown. So during the summer, you'd all run down there. You didn't care what was showing and you'd pay your dime or whatever and you'd watch movies all day long in the air conditioning because they were the only ones that could afford those units. Now, of course, everyone has them in their house and in their car. But that was a huge thing. Changed the way we lived our lives. So seven through 10, what, what belongs there? Computer. Oh, yeah, you gotta put the computer up here. And with the computer, what makes it so useful now is the internet. So again, we've gone from tapping out messages on a telegraph, to sharing them over radio, to showing live images on TV, to now seeing anybody is like their own TV station. You can post your stuff on YouTube, you can send video clips to anyone, you can have video phone conversations with anyone around the world for almost nothing. Yes? Um, um, stove. Stove. Yeah, I don't know how that, usually I have that over here in my top five. That kind of got bumped. So yeah, stove would be a very important one. Did we have the ability before? Sure. We have to go out and build a fire. So now it's minus 40 below, okay? And you have to go out and chop down a tree to bring in enough wood to light the fire, you know. We're talking an hour long or more just to get enough heat to begin to make dinner. Totally made life easier. You got one, Bianca? Washer and dryer. Washer and dryer. <laughs> I don't know that I put that on my top 10, just because I, I think there's some other things I'd rely on more. But it does save you going down to the creek and rubbing it on that board, right? Yeah. Yes. Microwave. microwave. Everyone wants the microwave in the top 10. We've got to beat the microwave. What do we got better than the microwave? A toaster. That's kind of like the stove. A car is not by itself an electrical invention. If it's an electric car, it is. But electricity is used just to start the car. It doesn't rely solely on electricity. An iPod. An iPod. <laughs> well, no one can come up with something better. Yeah? A generator. Generator. 
You know, a generator like we might have on our RV, you guys think of it there. You know, if you know what a generator is, it takes gas, you start it up, and it produces electricity, you can take it wherever. Well, guys, the generator is the thing that produces electricity, the power plant. Some of them run off of coal, some of them run off of uh, <coughs> gas, some of them will run off of water, making them do their spinning motion. But this is hugely important in getting electricity to us in the first place. We have a pretty good list. If yours is different, no worries. It doesn't have to be the same. But if you didn't finish the top part, you're going to finish that at home. What we're going to do now is make a circuit. Okay? There's a circuit drawn for you at the bottom of this page. And the word circuit, C-I-R-C-U-I-T, sounds a lot like what other word that begins with C-I-R? Circus. Circus? <laughs> huh? Circle. Circle, okay? If you look at that first circuit, you might be able to see kind of a circle there. What we're doing is we're creating a, a path for electricity to flow. And in a circuit, you're always going to have the following three things. Something that provides the electricity. What is that here? The battery. Something that uses the electricity. Light bulb. And something that carries it from point A to point B. A wire. So that's the most basic of all circuits. If we understand how that one works, we can build from there. Okay? So what I'm going to have you do, I'm going to give you a tray, one for each row. We're going to take out a battery, a wire, and a light bulb, and pass it back. When it reaches the back, just keep it there at the last person. Okay. I don't need you to talk for this yet, guys. Okay? You're working on this on your own. I want you to discover this on your own, how you make a circuit. Again, Every circuit's going to have something that produces electricity, something that uses it, and something that carries it. And every one of these things has two connections on it. The wire has the two places where the coating on the outside has been stripped off. The battery has the plus and the minus side. Okay? And the bulb has a pointy end that looks kind of dull silver on yours. And then it's got the side with the grooves, or threads, we call them. That's out here. Yours may be silver or it may be gold color. Okay, there's no need to talk. You take out your three things and pass it back. When it gets to the back, just hang on to it back there. You can put it on the ground behind you. Whatever. Huh? Just take it out of that one. Someone didn't put it back. All right. So what I want to do is we're going to do this first one together. We're going to make that one so you understand how it works. And for those of you that are a little challenged with uh, this kind of stuff, you hold the battery with your thumb on the bottom and your first and second fingers on the top, the pointy part, like so. Under your thumb, put one part of the wire. Between your fingers, put the light bulb, like so, so that the threads are resting on the pointy part of the battery. Okay? And do it so that the pointy part of the bulb is facing away from you, like this. Then you bring the wire around and you touch the point of the light bulb and it should light up. Okay? That is your first circuit. That is the one that is drawn here for you. It looks like that. Now, in order for it to function, everything must be connected. The point of the, of the light bulb and the threads of the light bulb must be connected to something. Both ends of the wire must be connected to something. And both ends of the battery have to be connected. If it doesn't light, one of two things have happened. You haven't connected something together or you've skipped something. If the battery starts to get hot, you've left the light bulb out of the circuit. Okay? So if the battery starts to get hot, it's not right. If the light bulb doesn't light up, it's not right. There are three other ways to attach these three things together and still get it to light. What I want you to do now is discover those three remaining ways of hooking it up and then draw a picture. You draw your battery and you label the pointy end plus, the other end minus, please no talking. 
and then you show where you're going to put the light bulb and where the wire goes. There are three other ways of doing it. When you get a second one, you'll see a pattern there. You should be able to easily tell what the remaining two Don't forget to include the plus and minus on your battery. Plus and minus.